welcome all of our military spouse entrepreneurs. We are in the Fort Bragg area, which is a hotbed for incredible military spouse entrepreneurs, um, especially women that are starting businesses while they're stationed here with their service member. And I'm really excited to have all of you here today because we're gonna be talking about the nitty gritty of starting a business and what's hard about it and then pairing that with military uh, lifestyle. My name is Liz Marion. I am the community manager for Launch Lab Online with Bunker Labs and part of our military connected community that we serve um, to start successful businesses are military spouses. So today I am honored to welcome all of you here. We're gonna do some introductions and I'm gonna start with Abby to my right. Hi, my name is Abby Ray and I am the founder and editor-in-chief of Legacy Magazine, a new print publication that highlights the families who serve our country and the communities that champion them. I'm Cameron Cruz. I'm one of the co-founders and co-CEOs of Our Riveter and we're a handbag company on a mission. So we support military spouses. They get to take their job with them no matter where the military takes them. And my name is Deshawn Russell, and I'm the owner of Southern Elegance Candle Company, and we create Southern-themed home fragrance products. Hi, my name is Tiffany Haywood. I'm a lifestyle blogger and media influencer, as well as the owner of Tiffany Haywood Blog and Brand Consultations. I help you build your business as we build your brand. My name is Leah Capps, and I'm a military spouse as well as a business owner, and we, or I own, Sage Harvest, and it's a um, company that uses the unlikely vessel of jerky and meaningful merchandise to reclaim hope for orphans. Hey there, I'm Dr. Patrice Carter, and I'm the owner and founder of Breakpoint Coaching, LLC, where I certify and train Christian life coaches, and I'm also a motivational speaker and author. Incredible, all of you, to have all of these women in one room is actually really special. And even though we're all linked by our military spousedom, as it were, um, we are so diverse and different and come from different points. So I wanna start kind of talking about being a military spouse and about our inner circle and who we rely on to make decisions before we get into this, you know, really in depth about entrepreneurship. So who is part of your decision making? And when you were starting a business, who did you have to ask? And I mean externally and your, your family, your spouse potentially, and what that looked like for you and the compromises that you maybe had to make early on in your business or that you didn't consider before you just jumped both feet in. So who would like to start? It's funny, I didn't ask anybody. <laughs> no, but we talked about it. So I would say that our, my inner circle comprised of my spouse and, um, and myself and then my business partner and her spouse. Um, so you very quickly become business married to those people, right? So um, we kind of threw it out there and we very, very slowly and kind of organically started one decision after the next. I think very quickly they realized, our spouses realized that, oh, they're serious about this. So yeah, we should start to be part of this conversation. Um, so we were all on the same page, but didn't necessarily ask anybody, I, I guess. For me, my husband was rather supportive mm -hmm. in the endeavor. Uh, I have uh, workaholic tendencies, so I think he was comforted in knowing I'd see it through. And then also, um, I had spent a lot of time before launching Legacy to kind of research best practices, what has been done, kind of identifying that target market and what that was like, so I think that was reassuring in, in starting. So I was, had that support there, which was nice. Mm -hmm. So I have a, I was gonna say, I have a funny story. So I wasn't married when I started my business. And so I didn't ask anybody like Cameron and Abby, I didn't ask for permission, but Dalton and I dated five months before we got married and I quit my job three months after we were married to go into full-time business <laughs> and marketplace ministry. So you're talking about cutting out $80,000 a year in salary. So I remember the day that I was at my position on Fort Bragg and I said, I need to talk to you. So I worked down the street from him. And so when he met me in the parking lot, I said, I feel like it's time for me to leave my job and go into full-time business. And if he said no, I'm thinking, I'm gonna have to go back and walk, the walk of shame down the street, <laughs> <laughs> have a seat back at this job I hate. And um, he said, well, if we say we have faith, then you have to get out of the boat. We have to get out of the boat and walk. So that was, I guess, the permission, that agreement more so than permission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, for us, it was actually kind of the reversal. It was more my husband saying, hey, maybe we should do this. And um, the pattern in our marriage has kind of been us embarking on these adventures together. And then he jumped ship and I would be <laughs> saddled <laughs> with said adventure. And so I um, was a little bit more reluctant and just said, I see us starting a business and then you deploying and me um, being at the helm of a, the business and the home by myself. Um, so I was, he, it took him a little bit longer to convince me that it was a good idea. And spoiler alert, I run a business by myself <laughs> and I'm at home with all the children by myself because he's gone, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, mine actually did not start initially as a business. I started as a lifestyle blogger and it was a hobby. My husband, we were in Hawaii, stationed in Hawaii, and he was never home. I had three kids under three and I literally just wanted an adult to talk to. So I started the blog so that I could kind of have that adult interaction. From there, it transitioned into a business. And when I started asking him, I need a new laptop, I need to buy a domain, I need to get all this stuff. He was like, so when's the money gonna start coming in? And I was like, oh, just trust me, it's gonna work, it's gonna work. And so he kind of just co-signed to it. He was like, okay, go ahead, do whatever. But once he started seeing an income, then he was like, okay, she's like serious, it's an actual mm -hmm. business. So that's kind of, I kind of fell into the business in, initially. Well, I quit my job. So, <laughs> and I tell everybody that is the worst plan ever. Do not <laughs> do that, do not, that is the worst plan. So I quit my job. Um, I just walked in and I was like, I'm done. I'm, not, I'm never coming back here. And then I went home and I was like, uh, I quit my job and I think I'm gonna make candles. <laughs> and it did not go over well at all um, because I had been in education for, 20 plus years, I was working on my doctorate in educational leadership. I had plans of, I was all deep entrenched in it and I knew nothing about business. So when I went home and was like, um, yeah, I quit and I'm gonna just do this thing. He was like, um, I'm gonna need you to go back and get your job. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of like, uh, no, I'm not gonna do that. So he was like, you got a year to kind of figure this thing out mm -hmm. to see where it goes. And then at, at the end of that year, then he was like, okay. You got another year. <laughs> <laughs> Buy yourself some more. Yeah, okay. I can see how this might work. So, but yeah, I didn't I didn't ask for permission and and yeah, that I don't recommend that. Talk, you need to talk. Mm -hmm. I recommend a conversation. Just a little. Conversations just a little, are good. A little, a little communication. Yeah. Don't just quit your day job. Yeah. Seriously. And you know, in, in talking about entrepreneurship, and I, I actually love that you say that you quit your job because it's coming to the realization of what is right for you and what makes sense for you. And in this lifestyle, I mean, we're faced with so many other challenges. Um, you know, Leah, and we'll have you share because your husband is deployed right now. Um, and so what about entrepreneurship? You're like, I just have to do it for myself. I have to pave my own way, make my own business, and maybe not knowing exactly what that business is gonna look like, but knowing that that's the right thing for you and your family and the lifestyle that you're living. So Leah, why don't we start with you? Cause I know that you just kind of shared. <laughs> so for me, it really wasn't that kind of mindset that I have to make my own way. Um, or, or it, was, it wasn't something that I was gonna claim as mine. It was really, I think our, uh, the, uh, the motivation came more from a burden on our heart than it did from like a fire in my belly to be a business owner. Mm -hmm. um, we had just a little background. When we started the business, we'd just gotten home from China on our, from our fourth adoption trip and we had six kids, two of which were biological and four who were adopted. And we were kind of really in the weeds as far as like, you know, emotional, um, our kids all came from trauma, so we were dealing with a lot of a lot of things there, and then they all had physical needs as well. Our our newest daughter had paralysis, and um, so we were really trying to figure that out, and then navigate military life as well. And we had had all these rapid fire deployments and adoptions and babies, and so honestly, I wasn't looking for something to do. I was exhausted, <laughs> but it seemed like um, we knew that whether we were tired or not, children were still dying in institutions because we had stepped into those institutions. So ours came more from a place of just feeling like, gosh, we have this responsibility to do something. Like our home is full and our schedule is full and our medical roster is full, but institutions are still full and children are still dying. So we don't really, um, 
we sh it's not right to tap out of the fight. It didn't feel right at the time, but we need to find a different way to be in the fight other than adopting because we were really burning it down. And, um, and so that's where we kind of just started trying to brainstorm ways to um, make more income and then kind of funnel those resources towards orphan care. So it really wasn't, I think I felt fulfilled and I felt like I had plenty to do, um, but it really just came from a place of like, hey, kids are dying and we have so much. Even though we are in the weeds and we feel so exhausted and depleted, we still have so much more than an orphan laying in an institution. So that really propelled us and kind of um, got us off the starting blocks into entrepreneurship. Yeah, well, who, I mean, it's kind of hard to go after that and say, I want to be rich. I just want to be rich. Can I just say that? I mean, I know it sounds horrible after your story of wanting to help people. I got tired of being poor. I grew up poor. I was a teacher. I was looking at my check every month like, oh my God, this is it. This, I'm never going to be able to afford that convertible Jag that I want. Um, I think I'm going to just do it myself and then let the chips fall where they may. Like, that really was kind of my mentality. I'm like, I'm just gonna take over the reins. I'm going to, and I was going through a midlife crisis. I had a kid at home, I was about 45. My kid was five. And I was like, I got 40 good years left. What do I wanna do with it? And I was like, I'm just gonna take control of my destiny and let the chips fall where they may. And hopefully somewhere in there, I'll be able to get that convertible Jag. But that literally was what I was thinking. Like, I just wanna be in charge of everything. Like, and I'm, and when people talk to me about the company, I'm still like, I am in charge of everything. Because when I left, I was like, I'm gonna be totally, completely, 100% in charge, and I am going to see exactly what can I do that is in my control. And I still feel like that, you know? And I don't have that convertible jag ask, yet. You know, like, <laughs> Actually, you know, I've been looking to be perfectly honest with you. So by the end of 2020, you are, it might not be convertible, but that jag is gonna get bought this year. I have already laid that out, yeah. When I think, you know, paving your way for me too in thinking about this, especially with all of your businesses, is that there's different motivations for everything. Yes, and it doesn't and all have to be orphan care. Like it doesn't mean that, uh, that one is less than the other. Other, yeah. you know, it's right. The most important thing is just identifying it and then staying yeah. true and authentic yeah. to that because there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rich and there's nothing wrong with wanting right. to help more from kids. Yeah. So as long as you identify that and you know exactly that's your the that's true North right. Star, yeah. Mm -hmm. Liz, I was going to say, just um, when we were asking the question about did we ask anybody for permission and then along the lines of this conversation, I think it's so important to give ourselves permission mm -hmm. to run after our dreams. And so for me, I wanted to just say this for the woman or even the man that has not done that, you know, that is always waiting for someone to okay or give them permission to run after the things they want to run after. I had bosses I hated. They always wanted to, you know, I won't say press me down in a sense, but, you know, I was very well educated, but never got the promotions, always got passed over, always some excuse. And I just didn't want to live like that anymore. I wanted to make my own way, just like Deshaun said. And whether I failed or not, I was going to try. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had a heart for women. So I just started with that. Where do I feel this fire in my belly? And it was to, help women to come out of that place of not using their voice, not living their fullest life. So just starting there, what's the thing that, you know, you would do if money was not an issue? Well, that's perfect because I do want to ask Cameron, I'm going to call you out here because you have a degree mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're an architect, but you own a handbag company. Already. There are some parallels. Really there are some parallels in construction. No, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a military spouse, so I mean, I was lucky enough to be in the same place long enough to get that degree, right? So um, I consider myself incredibly blessed to be able to do that. And then the day after I graduated, well, two days, so Monday, uh, we left for Dahlonega, Georgia, so the middle of nowhere. So I, I can only imagine how many times or how many military spouses are out in the middle of nowhere somewhere going, Oh, okay, I don't know what to do with myself. Like I had this student loans, I got a degree, you know, I've got this brand new piece of paper that was super expensive, I got a brand new wardrobe, and I got nothing. I got nothing within 40 miles of me. Uh, and so that's what our business was built out, built out of that, that idea that we wanted to help ourselves, but also to help every other military spouse that has ever found themselves in that place. And I was in a very similar boat. Mm -hmm. I was in the same- Also in Dahlonega. <laughs> same town, Dahlonega, Georgia. I was driving an hour and 45 minutes mm -hmm. to grad school. 
And within the first three years of our marriage, we lived in three different states. And with my degree, it's a marriage and family therapy and you have to get a new license in every state. So that meant studying for a licensure exam in three different states. So by pursuing entrepreneurship in, a, in an area or a field that I'm passionate about, it allowed me the opportunity to stay connected to my passions and then have that source of income until we got to a place where we are now and we're more stabilized in one area. Well, and talking about, you know, different motivations and, and Tiffany, you did speak to this just a little bit of, I just wanted to talk to adults, um, which, I, which I love that. Um, that's one motivation, you know, especially when you're a military spouse and you're at home, a lot of times you're a single parent um, and, you know, and just putting that on top of everything else as a business owner. So when you first discover that you could make money and what the, what the online market had for you. You know, what was that like, like being like, oh, entrepreneurship is a real thing. It can be for me. You know, it's not just talking to adults. When did it become more mission driven towards independence? That first time I got like a $20 check for <laughs> taking a picture of an item in my room, I was like, wait a minute, I can make money doing this? And the thing was, it was a bit of a press for me because even though it started out as a hobby, I need somebody to talk to, I want adult interaction. My husband was the sole breadwinner, the only source of income in our house. We had six kids and I, not that he was upset about it, I wasn't used to that. I've been working since I was 13. My mom gave me my working papers in New York. You had to get a little green card that said you could work. I had it the day after I turned 13 and I had worked that entire time. And then when he re-enlisted, all of that stopped because I couldn't keep a position because we were moving too often or my work history was so sporadic. They were looking at me like, so you know how to do what now? You only been there for like six months and what's going on? So I stopped wanting to explain why my work history was what it was. And I was like, you know what? This could be a perfect opportunity. I had a friend who was a blogger and she was like, yeah, you can totally make money doing this. But then my mind set changed as I was doing it because a lot of bloggers do it as a hobby. Even when they monetize, it's still kind of like, oh, it's not really a business. I'm just doing this and they pay me. But then I was like, I can make this my actual business. So that's when I took the steps to make it real. I got it as an LLC. I made sure all my stuff was in order. And that's when it changed. When you change your mindset about stuff, it helps to make the results different as well. So that's when I said, okay, I'm not just gonna do this as a hobby. It's not just gonna be a side hustle or a side income. Like I actually, I remember the moment when I was filling out a form and it said position or job or whatever, that first time when I did not put stay at home mom, it was like emotional for me. Cause I was like, I'm a business owner, like entrepreneur. And I was like, I didn't, almost didn't want to turn it in. Like, I was like, are they going to like laugh when I turn this into them? But it was like a big deal for me. And that's when everything started happening because I changed that way that I saw it. That's amazing. And I like, I love the tie-ins to, you know, and just to point out the, the similar things in our stories, you know, Patrice talking about mindset and, you know, you being in Del Dahlonega, Georgia, um, both of you actually, you know, and, and that realization of what was available to you. And I, and I do want to tie this too, because I think Patrice, you mentioned it. And obviously I called Cameron out um, about education piece of being passed over, over and over again, um, you know, and, and talking about that as a military spouse that you're moving so much and you're just being passed over because you have an entry level position that doesn't match what you're capable of mm -hmm. and what your skill levels are. And so entrepreneurship, it's, it's hard. You know, we can all admit that it's hard. And Leah, you certainly didn't need anything else on your plate. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but Deshaun, I wanna start with you. So let's talk about that hardest part of your entrepreneurship journey and how you got through it. And did your business improve because of it or not? Hardest. Like when people ask about hardest, like it's all hard. So I will tell you some of the hard things, period, because I don't think any of them is harder than the other. There is just hard. One of the first things that I had to contend with was I literally, I was working on my doctorate. I'm, I'm, I could literally go back to school in three months to be Dr. Russell. So I was entrenched in education. So going from an educator to a business owner, that shift took me three years. So just changing my mindset, saying that I am a business owner, um, was very, very difficult because I was an educator. So that's, that's one of the things that was very difficult. 
Um, number two is like making money. So I think we gloss mm -hmm. over the part that this is a business, mm -hmm. and it is my job every single day to make money. And I have to figure out how to make money. And my background was in education. So I have to learn how to do everything all the time. I'm in a constant learning state when you have a business. So um, that's hard. Um, and quite frankly, I did not want to be the face of the company. I was perfectly content being behind the scenes. So, like, stepping out in front of the camera and doing interviews and talking to people um, about the business, mainly because I felt like an imposter, because I felt like an educator instead of a business owner. So, stepping out in front of the camera and talking about the business and what I was doing has been hard. So, I don't think that there's ever um, a day, a month, a challenge that is, like, harder or the hardest. Um, they are every single day is a challenge, and you better just kind of get used to facing challenges every day and feeling like it's an uphill slog every day. Did the company get better? Yes, every single time. The company always improves, and it makes me a better CEO. And I have to, like, start using that type of language because that's literally what I am. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it makes... Once you get over the hump, like today, when I look at how much money we made, I'll be like, okay, I did my job today. Everybody's going to get paid. The lights are going to stay on. And we live to fight it another day. So, I, you know, you learn those skills. And then over time, you really, like, become who you think you are, you mm -hmm. know? So, but hard S, it's just hard. I would second. I mean, I think, too, you always think, especially when you start your business, there's going to be more time next year. There's going to be some time next January for me to get my crap together. Um, and there is never any time. It never gets easier. It's like raising children. You know, like when they're babies, it's hard. And when they're teenagers, it's hard. Everything just evolves. Um, so I would say, you know, never fool yourself into thinking there will be more time or more space or, you know, it's every time, every day, every year, every month, those challenges just evolve mm -hmm. and they're a constant. And every level that you get to, like, I thought that once we got to this level, like we do somewhere between 20,000 on a slow month, and I, I don't mind talking about numbers. I know people get all weirded out, but I'll, I'll talk about uh, money. So we do somewhere between 20,000 and about $50,000 a month. So I thought when we got to this level, like, it would be easy. No, this is just this level, and now I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I take this from, you know, an average of 30,000 or whatever it is a month to an average of 50,000 a month or 60,000 a month or 100,000 a month. So sometimes it's hard to like realize where you are and embrace like where you are and the success that you've achieved because as soon as you hit it, it's like you see, okay, this really isn't good enough. I got to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's an, again, that's just another kind of challenge that you never, I don't think you ever get to a point where you're like, this is great. You know, if I got to a, a million dollars a year, then it would be like, how do I get to three? Mm -hmm. And then if I got to, you know, three or four, I'd be like, okay, how do I get to 10? And then if I, and I'm, I'm still not joking, like, and then if I got mm -hmm. to $10 million a year, I would still be like, okay, now how do I get to 50? Mm -hmm. Now how do I sell it? How do I find investors? Mm -hmm. Like every level is going to be if you are a high achiever and like to be number one, um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some people will get to a certain level and be like, I'm good. But if you're like constantly trying to grow the company and be better, you are going to keep pushing yourself and pushing yourself and pushing yourself. And that, in a sense, is good, but in a sense, it's not healthy. Yeah, kind of just, it's almost as if the challenges just grow mm -hmm. with your business. As your business grows, your challenges mm -hmm. grow. Uh, there was one incident about two volumes ago where we had received all of our volumes um, with a printing error. So the printer had sent us $1,000 worth of magazines that had the wrong cover weight. And so with them having to cover that, because it was an error that was on their part, um, it took a lot of back and forth. So for every phone call, every email that was pushing our delivery date back, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but they finally agreed to a remedy, so we shipped them back, and then I get another email that says there's an unexpected paper shortage. Mm -hmm. So this um, lit a fire under my tail, and so I hopped on a plane, 
flew to San Antonio, Texas, and um, visited the warehouse. And um, by doing that, it provided the opportunity for us to share a live update with our our audience with our fan base. And by doing that, it actually provided us the opportunity to invite them into the change in narrative. And it really proved to be beneficial in the sense of being open with them and kind of allowing them in to see that challenging moment and how we were handling it. So it turned out to be beneficial. Yeah, well, I think, is key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think, you know, and I mean, I know, you know, when you receive a legacy magazine, it's so pretty and, you know, you go open it and, and all this thing and, and it's a physical product and, and a lot of um, your products are physical products, you know, and it's and the jerky. I mean, when you taste it or you get the package or something like that and it's harder with a physical product sometimes. Um, what are you presenting? You know, and that goes, I'm sure Tiffany would say into the branding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so what are some of the challenges, Tiffany, that you've had particularly in your business, um, you know, building and, and making that pivot too, from blogger to actually being a consultant and building other people's brands? So that pivot actually happened because at, during my journey to becoming a blogger and a successful blogger who could actually count on an income, I had to learn a lot of things that other people weren't necessarily willing to teach because a lot of different, even business owners, they kind of, hi, like, like you're cheating on a test paper. Like I'm going to keep my stuff over here and you do yours. So there was things that I couldn't figure out. Google became my best friend and I had late nights and early mornings before school drop off and after trying to figure out how to do certain things. And then I actually sat there and I was like, why does this have to be so hard? And so as I became an expert in certain things, I said I wanted to share that with other people and with other bloggers. And branding became my thing because I love to represent what my business is in every way possible. And that's how that started. It pivoted from just being a blogger to helping other people build a blog and their business in general. I love small business owners. I love women entrepreneurs. And trying to give them that, those little tips and tidbits that let them make that switch it's awesome. And seeing that look on their face when they're like, I can actually do this. Like, I don't always have to hire someone. Like, I yes, I am a consultant, but for all my clients, I always like to have them to the point where I can teach them to walk away and do it themselves. I don't want you to rely on me. So when I get them to that point, it's like super satisfying. And I'm just like, yes, I did that. And look at them go and look at them do that. And when you were speaking about that transparency moment, when you were able to let your audience behind the scenes, that's something I teach my clients and my businesses all the time. Don't be so perfected because everybody knows that's not for real. <laughs> we all have those moments where things go wrong, shipments are late. Show that part because it actually builds that loyalty. And I always tell, I almost sing this song to every client, people will fall in love with a person before they fall in love with the product. The product will come naturally. Mm -hmm. So if you can get them to link to you and what you are and why you're doing it and what your purpose and your passion is, your product is just going to fall right in line with that. So that's the part of where the consulting comes in. I love to teach that. I love, I just love that moment of seeing that look on their face where like, yes, I got this. And I'm like, yeah, you do. And then like, it's just awesome. I want to just go back to what Deshaun and Cameron were sharing and Abby about the hardest part, that it is always hard. But I think we have to learn to manage our expectations uh, because you don't sow a seed and then harvest a seed in the same day. And I know I went into entrepreneurship thinking, man, I'm about to kill the game. I'm about to rock <laughs> You know, I'm going to be a millionaire like tomorrow. And I think that's why a lot of people get discouraged because they're mm -hmm. not prepared for the pitfalls that happen, not only day in and day out, but from Cameron and I were talking about this from one minute to the next. Mm -hmm. So you can be on top in your business at 10 a.m. And by 10 p.m., you're on the ground crying and just wondering, <laughs> like, can I even do this? But before I left my job, as I was leaving my job that I mentioned earlier, my boss, my ex-boss said to me, what qualifies you? Who do you think you are? to tell anybody anything when I told him that I was going to go and become a Christian life coach. And he said, well, what qualifies you to even do that? And that really like, you know, almost set me back. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, you know what? We got to keep it G for Cameron. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I really had to talk to myself and believe that what was there was really there and then walk that out. So then when Deshaun was talking about feeling like an imposter, how and people not opening doors because people wouldn't give me information on how do I become a speaker, how do I become an author. People that could open doors wouldn't open doors. So you really have to become your own cheerleader and really have a strong why for what you're doing. So that if 
day in and day out, you don't have someone telling you how awesome you mm -hmm. are, that you can do it. You're still about your business mm -hmm. and then scaling it that way. But I think it starts with expectation. And the last thing is not having, being able to shift from an employee mindset to a boss mindset. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Because I struggle with that every day. I will go in my office and have this sort of nine to five mentality and then try to come out of that and end up working until midnight, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning because the business is calling, you have to work it. So just figuring all those things out, but being a boss and not an employee is critical, I feel, in your business. Because you show up differently. It really is. And I had this conversation with Patrice because we know each other off camera. <laughs> and <laughs> I had this conversation because as a consultant, people, people hire me to help their brand to build their business. But I was still in that employee mentality. Mm -hmm. So when they would make these outrageous demands, I'm thinking, well, yeah, sure, okay, I'll try to do that. And my husband actually had a conversation. He was like, you better boss up. He was like, you're the boss, not them. Stop letting them like ride and tell you everything to do. And that was one of my hardest moments. And this was recently. Like the first hard moment I had was when my husband was like, okay, I don't see any money. Like, like two or three years in, he was like, I don't see an income. He was like, I'm giving you, like, we're pushing, where's, where's the money? And I was like, it's coming for sure, I promise. Like, look, I got 20 bucks. And he was like, 20, and like, this is not balancing out. That was the first hard moment. But then when the income started coming in, my second was actually changing that mentality. Like, I am no longer an employee. Not that being an employee is bad, but when you're a boss, you can't think like an employee. You have to set standards. You have to, you almost have to give your clients clients a limit because if not they will run you like an employee and so changing that mindset was one of my hardest turnarounds because I always felt like I was disappointing somebody mm -hmm. I'm a people pleaser by nature so I just wanted to make everybody happy but that wouldn't necessarily make my business happy mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to change that can I speak on the money um real quick um because I think that especially if you're a product-based business. Mm -hmm. You think that you're gonna just make the widget and everybody's gonna buy the widget. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work like that. No, you know what I'm saying? And people always ask me, like, how were you able to grow the company so quickly? How were you able to get so much traction? And it's because I literally had somebody paying the bills. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to worry about paying the bills. I could take all of the money that I made from the company, all of our profit, and invest it back into the company to grow the company. So, and it's not like I was making, you know, a whole lot of money. It was very small, but I was still not worrying about are the lights gonna be on. Mm -hmm. And so, two things. Number one, like, you're not gonna make a lot of money in the beginning. You're just not gonna make a lot of money. And, you know, if you have somebody to pay the bills, that helps grow the company. And um, two, like, Patrice was saying, you, you really got to manage those expectations. Um, for our, a product-based business, those first three years, we were talking about it earlier, if you make $20,000 a year, like as your salary, which was considerably less than what I was making as, a, as an educator, um, you're, you count yourself blessed. And then that fourth year is when you might see a turnaround. Um, and but you're, we're still not talking rich kind of money, you know. So it's a grind, and people need to know that it is a grind, and you are not going to be making a lot of money, and everybody needs to be on board with, you know, maybe eating some ramen. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's always a trade-off. I feel yeah. like there's there's different ways to start it, right? You can bootstrap, and you mm -hmm. can put everything back in, and you can make your 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 dollars and put your dollars back in and just incrementally grow mm -hmm. or you can plan 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 gather all of the you know the forces and and have more capital off the bat and potentially make more money but you're always going to trade mm -hmm. one for one and the way that we grew was definitely bootstrapping and so yes every five dollars that we made we put four and a half back in you know and so it was make two bags to make three bags make three bags to make ten bags and at the end of the day there's not a whole lot left over um, to take home, and I think that was one of my biggest uh, learning curves as a just a just a human being is the unexpected cost, both financially and emotionally, of mm -hmm. running and growing a business, mm -hmm. is something to not underestimate when you consider it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I mean, yes, every day is a learn. Every day is you learn something, you evolve. I mean, being able to build something, I think, is important for your soul. Mm -hmm. um, 
but man, there's just so much to it that you just have yeah. no idea. <laughs> I think that's probably been our biggest yeah. challenge too, is just trusting that slow and steady work because mm -hmm. you're just mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. seeing that breakthrough moment mm -hmm. a lot of the times. And um, we, uh, we always go back to bamboo for our children and our business, and we trust that you know that bamboo grows so much underground mm -hmm. before it shoots up. I think it's for like four or five years. It does all its growth underground. And so we kind of rely on that metaphor a lot um, and just trust that we are investing and we're setting the conditions just right. And then you do just kind of hope that you get that mm -hmm. breakthrough moment, but a lot of it is just bootstrapping in the beginning. And I think that, our biggest challenge probably hasn't been one big event. It's just that kind of like slow grind of um, just putting in the work and maybe not seeing that tipping point or breakthrough moment right away and just waiting that out. So I just wanted to add for those service-based businesses that are watching or that will watch because even though I have a product on the table, I'm predominantly 90% service-based. And I think that's very challenging because how do you quantify and qualify a service? And so I think that's important, the things that we're talking about, something that Leah just pointed out, was that bamboo mentality that it's not going to grow overnight. And you have to be known, you have to work to build that platform, mm -hmm. you have to network, you really have to get out there. And when people ask you, why should I pay you this amount of money, or how do you justify that cost? Because I've had clients ask me that, why would I pay you, say, $1,500, where you're paying me for my experience, my expertise, or they invite, they invite me to speak. We only want you to speak 30 minutes. You're paying for all of my years of experience and my PhD in 30 minutes doesn't matter a hill of beans because what I'm bringing you can't be quantified in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. being able to own that space and not be haughty. Mm -hmm. We will be haughty. Well, you know, and it's interesting because, I mean, I actually had a coach say to me, <laughs> they're not, well, no, <laughs> but you know, they're not paying you for the fact that you can do the work mm -hmm. in half the time. They're paying you for the 20 years that got you to that point, mm -hmm. right? Of being able to do the work in one hour, but they have to pay for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I know. do have to show that I can provide value and why. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and not only that, I've sewn a lot. I've given a lot of free books. I've mm -hmm. given a lot of free talks. I've given a lot of free coaching. And so I don't mind sewing. But then when there's a season to harvest and I have to know, and a business has to know when it's time to stop sewing and start bringing that harvest back in. And also to piggyback on that, on a branding perspective, mm -hmm. even as a blogger, I wrote an entire post on sometimes it's okay to blog for free mm -hmm. because you have to establish the fact that you actually know what you're doing. Because okay. no one is gonna pay you based on you just saying, I really know what I'm doing. Right. Like I, anybody can say that. So even when I started blogging, before I got my first $20 little paycheck, I went and bought, bought dull frozen fruit slices and did a how-to on a smoothie all out of my own pocket. But based on that, that's where that $20 check came from because they saw that post and it was like, oh, okay, she knows how to brand it, she knows how to take pictures, et cetera, et cetera. And so I had that there as my foundation to say, hey, I do know what I'm doing. You might want to pay me for this kind of thing. And then the thing, same thing goes for a service base. Mine is service based. Like it's all based on, hey, I know what I'm doing, I know how to present, I know how to give you a workshop, I can get my points across. But like Patrice was saying, I couldn't just walk in and say, hey, you need to pay me X amount of dollars because trust me, I know what I'm saying. I had to prove it. So there were plenty of workshops I did that were just to get myself out there, to get my name out there, to establish the fact that, hey, she has results and it shows that. And it can be a difficult journey and sometimes you're just sitting there going, oh my gosh, I'm just doing this for absolutely nothing mm -hmm. and I need some money. And you have your husband going, so where's the money? <laughs> but, <laughs> but once you hit that pivot point and when it starts to come in and you start to get those testimonials from your clients. From a branding perspective, when you are service-based, get those testimonials. Mm -hmm. Like after I do a consultation, after I do a workshop, the first email that goes out Tuesday, two days later is, how did you like your experience? I take that and that becomes my reference point for why my prices are what they are. This person says this, and this is where they are right now. So using all of that and learning how to build your business based on what you do, even if it's not an actual product, like when you guys ask for a product, I was like, I got business cards. Like, <laughs> let me put those down there. But using what people have to say about what you've done is a great way to get that out there. So I think we're just saying social proof. 
Mm -hmm. you know, well, and it gives you the opportunity to hone your craft because mm -hmm. like when we first started making bags, I mean, God, if anybody's got one of those bags, I'll take it. I will trade you. Um, we didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to trade. You keep that in your archive. Um, but we had no idea what we were doing. We had not only did we have no idea on the hard skills, like the tactical skills, mm -hmm. but we also had no idea where the business was going to go. So we, there was custom bags. There was um, military spouses can sell the bags and they can make the bags and, you know, there was all of these ideas and it took us two years to hone down and say what is really important and that's the beauty of getting out there and doing things for free and doing things um, you know maybe a little bit more scrappy is because before you spend a hundred thousand dollars you really get to know what it is you want to spend a hundred thousand dollars on. And can I just say do something <laughs> like like whatever yeah. it is that you want to do just do, yeah, it. do it just yeah. absolutely yeah. do it yeah. I love to show where we started oh God. Yeah. and then where we are now. Like mm -hmm. I absolutely always show the progression so that people don't think that it started like mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. and in this space. Like, no, I started with like two pots in my kitchen and printed out my own labels with, you know, generic boxes selling at the flea market. So let's, you know, but that's where I started, you know, and it just grew and grew and grew. Mm -hmm. And so you always have to, like do it, mess it up, get better and grow it. But just get out there and like really just do mm -hmm. something or cause you, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you, you can't become an expert with them 10,000 10, hours that you need of doing whatever the thing is, mm -hmm. you know, you can't get to the expert level if you're just kind of sitting at home thinking about it <laughs> or worrying about the labels like being crooked. I sent out plenty of crooked labels, but eventually we got a process in place where the labels are straight now, <laughs> but it took 10,000 10, hours to figure out how to get it done. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you just get out there and do it though. Uh -huh. Do something, I don't care how crappy it is. Now don't let it stay crappy, um, yeah. I'm gonna need you to get better. Better, but just, you know, get out there and do something. I think that's so important too. And like you said to like Cameron, you have kind of this rough draft of your dream mm -hmm. and you have to hold that part very loosely, but then those core things that really matter to you, hold those tighter. Um, and I think especially as military spouses, there's so much that's out of our control. Um, and there's so many circumstances that are constantly changing. And so you have to be really good at kind of just stepping out with your rough draft of a dream, but then letting it evolve and take shape that so that it can fit into this military life. And um, and so I think I think you're right, like come out there with that rough draft of dream, but be okay when it changes and don't feel defeated or discouraged. Um, and yeah, cause I never thought I'd be peddling jerky in a Southern <laughs> town with eight kids and a husband on another continent. That was not my first version of a dream, but, but it's rich and fulfilling. And so, but I think you're right. Like you just gotta come out there with something mm -hmm. and get going. And so many times it's the more, the path that we never knew existed exactly. is so yeah. much more fulfilling than the so path that we richer. had laid out. You know, that architect, like that nine to five salary that I was going to yeah. have and that amazing whatever the hell it was going to be, yeah. excuse my language. Um, <laughs> but it's just so much more fulfilling, uh, this thing that I've carved out for myself and my family and my business partner and even, you know, our, our team. Yeah, and your metric for success mm -hmm. changes. I think mm -hmm. ours is, like, I'm going to be completely transparent. We are not killing it at all. Like, we are, we're not. We, <laughs> Devin and I are, I think, probably a year into the business, somebody asked us about our profit and loss statement, and we were like, hmm, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> <You're> just, <laughs> little bit. <note>. Like, <laughs> <now we're right. laughs> killing it. We fly by the seat of our pants. But um, but our metric for success is is hopefully bringing hope to to children who don't have it. And so um, and hopefully even if we closed our doors tomorrow and even if we had a little debt, there would still be children that have homes because that little store existed. Mm -hmm. And we um, we our faith is very important to us. And I keep thinking when I feel like, gosh, we're just not getting traction. I keep thinking of the parable of the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how God would go, he would leave the 99 to go after that one. And we have a child in our home now who we call our son, but only came to us because of that store. And, and he was in a very dark, dark place. And, um, 
Ed was being neglected and abused and because of our shop is now our son and has had multiple surgeries and is learning to speak and love and trust. And for us that, I have to keep going back to that, that yes, this profit and loss statement that I now know is a thing doesn't look so great, <laughs> but this child looks so good. And so our metric of success for success has, has changed and evolved as our business has and um, changed and evolved. I think that's part of the freedom of living as an entrepreneur. You get to set those standards for yourself. Yeah. Because I know as an employee, I worked, I had a lot of things. I was an obituary writer. Wow. Go figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. Blogging practice. Yeah. It was. Like, I love to write, but it was fun. Um, I was a paralegal, and I did account, like, I was an account manager, and all of those things actually do yeah. lead in and seed into what I do now, mm -hmm. but I wasn't passionate about any of them. Like, none of them sparked that energy. I didn't get up in the morning thinking, I'm going to go write an obituary. You know what I mean? None of that was a passion for me. But when you have that passion and you build that foundation for yourself, it has a different outcome. You put more into it. It has a different set of goals. So even though, like she said, that profit and loss might not line up according to what your accountant wants to see, when you're satisfied for where you are and you know that you're actually fulfilling the purpose of what your business is, mm -hmm. it, it has a whole different it resonates in a different way. I'm not gonna lie though, the first time I saw my account and it was in the green, like I made yeah. a profit, I was like, woo, let's go buy coffee or something, like, yeah. and then spend it. But no, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah, like, I made five dollars, let's go get a Starbucks. But no, it was still an awesome feeling, but seeing that aha moment in my clients outweighed that completely. Yeah, and to go back to get out there and do something, so, and the idea of these other areas of your life that present themselves as a military spouse, like there's a short season here, there's a short mm -hmm. season here, um, and I have this expertise and I have this interest. Um, my journey leading up to legacy was I had studied marriage and family therapy, right? I wanted to help families, but I also studied photography. And then I had this natural um, draw towards marketing. And so like, while none of this made sense along the way, it's something that every aspect of that is something I use now within Legacy. So it's like you may not understand exactly where your journey is taking you, but all of it can add value. Seriously, 10 years ago, if you would have told me that my life would look like it does now, there is absolutely no way that I would have believed you. Like there, there is not an inkling that my life now, it is, it was inconceivable 10 years ago, you know, from the kid to the business to being a CEO, like my, in, my entire life structure. Like there are plenty of days, like I walk into, in, into this space and I just kind of stop at the door because I got people working and I got all of this stuff going on and packages so are going out and I'm just, and I just kind of stop at the door and I just go, like, I did this? Mm -hmm. It's still amazing. So I don't think every single one of those experiences, though this company came into development because we were stationed in Germany and I just wanted to come home. And so the whole company is based off of that premise that I just want to go back home. And I created a whole company around everything that I loved about being at home. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There is no way when I was in Germany that I knew that this was going to happen. Right. So, you know, all of those experiences, mm -hmm. if you take them and just put them all together, it can just lead to something phenomenal, mm -hmm. seriously. And as, you know, and as we're talking about this, you know, with military spouses and um, especially Abby, I want you to speak to this about telling the story of our community. And, you know, I always think it's really funny um, that when you meet a military spouse, you kind of look at each other eye to eye and it's like, oh, I just surpassed five years of our friendship. Mm -hmm. I know I know something about you. I know something about your heart and who you are and what you've been through and telling those stories, but also that community being part of our entrepreneurship stories and a part of our journey. Um, and Cameron, I know, you know, specifically for your Riveters. Um, so speaking to that, but you've, you know, with Legacy, you're telling those stories. So can we talk about part of being a military spouse and military community being part of your story and why it also kind of builds into your business's story Absolutely. as well. So for me, it was 
I felt like there was a lot of media around all the hardships, right? And we are well acquainted with the hardships of the military spouse life. And while that those are very true and real experiences, I also started to see these glimmers of hope that I didn't feel like had a big light shined on, like take Cameron's um, uh, company with our Riveter and how it was, okay, there's this crappy situation where we're either underemployed or unemployed, so let's change that narrative. And, and so the whole idea with Legacy is to kind of help readers see their glimmer of hope and help change that narrative of like, how can we take these hardships and turn them into something that's beautiful or powerful? And so um, as you started to explore more stories with different people, they became more and more inspiring and hopeful to where it's almost like this lifestyle prepares you for entrepreneurship and it prepares you for a rich life if you embrace it. I agree, and we're also surrounded by a community. I, I know here there's a lot of special forces community and um, I think you're surrounded by people who will, or I know, we're surrounded by people who will jump out of airplanes into combat zones at a moment's notice. So I think that informs how you, and like you said, prepares you to make these choices that seem bold, um, but in comparison to what they're doing every day, you know, we kind of laugh at selling dried meat, feeling risky, you know, it just <laughs> is not, it doesn't feel like that bold of an endeavor compared to what many of our friends do. So I think that it emboldens you and, um, and that courage and that just brave way of, of living, it kind of is a, a little contagious, I think. So I think it does prepare you being in this community. Yeah, perspective is everything. I mean, I think being a young entrepreneur, not understanding business, not understanding what this was gonna take, and now that you know, I guess I spent almost 10 years doing it, that perspective shift and everything that I've gained along the way, but it's the same thing where yeah. you think about risk or you think about what's hard, right. and you're like, okay, let's shift the perspective exactly. a little bit. You know, like I a, think I can do this. Yeah. I can wake up every day and do this, and if, if my husband can do that. Yeah, and a bad day at work for them, mm -hmm. I mean, at the risk of sounding dramatic, but it's true, is somebody gets killed or injured um, so a bad day for us if we have you know not a great day in cells like that's not really a bad day mm -hmm. so I think it does it, it, it emboldens you and, and makes you want to live a little bit more courageously and then gives you perspective on what really matters and what a bad day in business looks like so yeah and I, I know Patrice I've seen you speak about this about the courage um, and you speak about you know coaching women um, to have that voice and to say this is what I'm going to do. Um, so that mindset, you know, and speaking about that being emboldened, you know, what do you tell your, your clients that are, you know, considering should I step out into my real life or should I stay, you know, where, I, where I'm at? You know, and putting it in perspective too, I think with the military is, um, is just a, it's a good comparison. I mean, as serious as it is. I think there's so many ways I want to answer that, but what comes up for me is resilience and redefinition mm -hmm. because I'm on the other side of the spouse spectrum. So I'm 51. I'm married to, so I'm a veteran, Army Reserve veteran. I'm married to um, Army veteran who is a disabled veteran also. So I think that my experience is so much different. I almost don't feel sometimes like I should be at the table in that sense because I am on the other side. So I've had to think for myself, showing up as I want to help others be shown up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So just pulling from my middle school sister's resilience and then using that courage that they show every day because their husbands are still in the fight, they're still in the fight to allow that to redefine my thought patterns and helping other people be redefined in that way. So through coaching, I don't do so much coaching anymore as much as now I help train other coaches to become coaches. So that's what I want to give back to my middle schools is if you're younger or older, using all these experiences of resilience and redefine yourself, become a coach, take what you've gained through all these years of being a military spouse, of all these different moves and transitions, and begin to give that back as a gift to someone else. And so I don't know if that helps or that answers mm -hmm. the question, but in my training them, I'm constantly using my faith, so using my faith as a guide and using my experience as a guide and helping them learn a model and a way to do that and then creating it as a business. Well and, some, well, and something I say is, you know, once a military spouse, always a military spouse. Like it lives in you and part of these pieces of character that we gain, right, for just dealing with the hardships that, that is apparent to everybody and in movies and all of these sorts of things. Um, you know, and, and just really redefining that. I love that of, and, and pulling that into legacy of being able to change 
the narrative of, of what we're capable of and what does a military spouse look like. And after the fight, <laughs> what does it look like? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I always speak to after the fight because mm -hmm. I didn't get to start my business until the end. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole time, you can do a product-based business, you know, while you are moving, but it's just gonna be small, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just, you're not gonna be able to have a whole manufacturing space. You're just gonna have to keep your expectations small. But I wasn't able to do this until we were settled in one place. And basically he was retired and he had his retirement and he had his real job and we had enough money coming in that I could just quit and not worry about the lights being paid. If I had started it while we were still, you know, moving every three years, I just don't know. It would have taken so much longer to get it to where it is now. Mm -hmm. So I represent literally what can happen once they retire, you know. Yeah, and I'm yeah. I'm kind of in the same boat because my husband is retired. Um, I started the blog portion right when we were leaving Hawaii, and then everything else kind of happened here once we got settled and picked like this as our forever place. But for me, the mill spouse community is an inspiration, and it kind of empowers me because I have mill spouse clients who will come to me because they're looking online because they know they're not going to be permanent anyway. They're, they know online is pretty much their biggest or best option to be able to start a business and have a product and push things out there. So when I see them pushing for that, I want to try to make that transition as easy as possible. So that's why I feel like my skill set should be open to them. And I'm going to try to tell them as much as I can to help make it easier because I remember the struggle. Mm -hmm. When you remember what you came from and how hard it was for you to get started, mm -hmm. you don't want to see somebody else go through that. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's my motivation for a male spouse. When I see them and I see I know their purpose because I used to be there and I'm like, hey, you don't have to do it this way. It doesn't have to be this hard. Let's try this. And I think the more we share our stories, the more we share the struggles, um, the victories, the more others are inspired to try and change their narrative. Absolutely. I was going to say that connectivity is so important, whether it's just that reciprocity from sharing the trade secrets, you know, mm -hmm. and then that grows your brand and ultimately lifts everybody in the community. But, you know, from... I mean, I just remember meeting Deshaun and, and thinking like, God, she she really started her business off on a completely different way. And I learned so much from just listening to her the first 30 minute conversation that we had. Um, and it's changed the way that I think about things and the way that I will approach things. And like Abby with Legacy, I, I kind of saw that period where you were strategizing, you know, and I knew Abby had her head down for a little bit and there was something big at the end of that. And so just being inspired by how everybody kind of has their own personal strengths and they deal with that and they bring that to the table and you can learn and collaborate and that sort of connectivity and networking with our community is so incredible. And let me just say, I, I, let me make sure I put this on the table. Our very first store was pressed that's owned by Ashley, mm -hmm. who is a military spouse. Mm -hmm. And I remember meeting her, I was, it was at a, a Millspo event, mm -hmm. and I was sick, and I was like, please, can you just carry my candles? And she kind of looked at me like, uh, <laughs> well, sure, because I just opened a store and we need stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first store. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after, y'all went on Shark Tank, mm -hmm. and I showed up and was like, hey, um, I got these candles, and y'all were like, hey, we need stuff, <laughs> you know, to sell, sure. So those two accounts by military spouse owners, like really was the base of my company and provided that first consistent income. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still in our Riveter. We still do a custom line of candles mm -hmm. and we're still impressed. Like, it, so yeah, like that, that spouse community, was invaluable, invaluable. And Deshaun, I think, I think it's important to point out, like you said, you couldn't have started this until later, and we couldn't have started what we started until we kind of were able to have a little bit of roots somewhere, and they are shallow roots because we're still in the military, but we were able to stabilize a little bit here. Um, and I think, I think it's important. I wouldn't want people to watch this and feel like they're not made of what we're made of. I think it's important to point out there are different seasons mm -hmm. in, in a military spouse's life. And there have been spout or seasons in my life where crushing it means getting dinner on the table. <laughs> and then sometimes crushing it means increasing sales by 15%. Mm -hmm. But for a long time when we were moving so often, and like you said, trying to just um, get a new nursing license in every state we went to. and. 
I had children in the hospital and a husband deployed, really crushing it, was just really it just yeah. Yeah. getting up and getting dinner on the table. And there's, and there's a time for that. And then, um, but I think everybody has this capability once, once the conditions align and so. Well, I think also, it, you know, something that, I, that I've heard from all of you is tying this back into some sort and um, we talked about at the beginning, motivation, but mission driven as well. Um, and Deshaun, like your anecdote of just, I wanted to go home, you know, and when you smell your candles and like, I'm from the South, I live in California now. I mean, I gotta have some Appalachian Trail candles like at home because otherwise I kind of forget, you know, about what, what it smells like. Um, but talking about that mission driven part of this that also ties into our military spouse community and ties into the resilience that Leah's talking about and like it's already in you, you know, and then tying that back into the mission of business um, and making sure you're serving a lot of times those that serve as well, you know, and so, can we talk about tying that mission and then reevaluating that mission? And maybe as Patrice is saying, how that mission changes as you're building and growing your business. Um, and Cameron, we can go to you first, because I do want you to mention your riveters and, and, and what that process is like of, you know, identifying a military spouse as the challenge of unemployment. Yeah, absolutely. So, w I mean, when Lisa and I found ourselves in Delonica, we realized that this is going to be a thing. We're going to move every two to three years, and you might not be near anywhere that's going to have your, you know, an opportunity for employment. And so we were, you know, a little bit in a selfish way, what are we going to do for ourselves? And then we had this light bulb moment where we were like, we are not the only ones. Like, why not make something just not for ourselves, but for all of military spouses? And so we kind of had that, that, you know, brainchild. And then, um, I don't, I don't, it's so, you know, being able to take your job with you from one place to the next means you have one less thing to worry about, right? So that identity that you feel with your career of what you do and who you are is one less thing that you have to plug and play every time you move. So that was so important for us to be able to foster that type of community and provide that type of opportunity. Um, and then I don't know if we had started any other mission or started without a mission like that, if we would still be here today. Because there are those days in, in business where you're like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know what I did. You know, I have no idea. And then, of course, we build a team. So we have not only remote riveters across the country, but we have a team of fab shop employees. We have a retail team. We have an executive and an administrative team across the country. So we do it for them. You know, like uh, sometimes that burden is so heavy as a leader and as a business owner and as a mom and a spouse and everything that you're carrying can be just completely crushing but you go into work every day and you see the smiling faces of your team or maybe maybe the not so smiling faces someday um, but you realize that you're doing it for them and there i don't think i would be here if i had not had a mission driven uh, aspect to the business I would say my story is very similar. Everything that I have done since um, I feel like grad school has been very mission driven. Um, it's it's something that keeps me going even in the 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 harder moments of um, challenges of running a business and doing that on your own and having a husband deployed and having small children to raise. Um, when we went in, when I shifted into legacy, it had to whatever it was going to become had to be something that added value to my family's life and our community's life. And so while it started with this idea of let's help military families change their narrative if they're not happy with it, um, I think our culture is shifting. So with every shift in our community, there's kind of that re-examination of like, what is the need of the community right now? Mm -hmm. And so that as that changes, I feel like our mission will change and grow with it. So my mission, I agree with what, you know, everyone has shared. I really resonate with what you guys have all shared. And that is, um, there's a scripture that informs our mission, too. And one, it talks about um, how in Luke, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. And what that means is there's, if we all look around, there's something that we can be pulling from, sowing from, and adding to, is how that translates in the world. And then the other talks about how Jesus went around healing and doing good works. 
So through my work, I want to heal and I want to do good works. So I feel like there are a lot of spouses. I think it's, I feel like it's untapped. This could be just my own narrative, my own view. But I think there are a lot of spouses who are faith-based, who are Christian, that really want to learn how they can have a marketplace ministry or do a business, which we call it marketplace ministry, where they could bring their faith and their desire to do that purpose that they've been created for. And so that's my mission, is to help those women to actualize that vision of purpose and putting that towards helping others. But in addition, the end state is I want to help solve problems for women that need money for their family. So as a spouse, I'm contributing financially to my household while being on purpose. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's what I do, and that's what I want to multiply and recreate through my company. For me, I think my mission has changed as I've gotten further into my business. Like initially, like I said, I just wanted to talk to grown-ups, and then it became more of I want to support and help other small business owners and women entrepreneurs. But just recently, my daughter had an assignment. She's in fifth grade, and they asked her to write about something that impacts society. And she was going through this list and she was like, what about women in business, mommy? You're a woman in business. And I was like, okay, yeah, that works. And I'm thinking she's gonna write like real business. She was like, no, I'm gonna write about how back in the days, <laughs> women couldn't have a job. They were the property of their husband. She was like, but now we can make our own jobs. And she, this morning, literally, I read her paper and she wrote about me and I was like standing there like, oh my God. But she was writing about the fact that I didn't have to fit into a job that was already existing. She was like, I think it's really cool that women can make their own job now. They can do what they want. If you have this skill set, my mommy is really good at talking, that's what she says. <laughs> and so she made a job. <laughs> she made a job where she gets to talk to people all the time and my mommy likes to see other mommies do good. So she made a job where she can help them do that. And so she kind of repurposed my mission a little bit, even in her process of getting there, because I was like, you know what? Things have changed. We don't have to be a secretary or somebody's assistant or even the boss, a manager somewhere. I can make my own position. I can make it what I need it to be. And then that can work for me. Because even though now I've actually added being an employee to being an entrepreneur, it's in a field that still lines up with what my purpose is. Like, I knew it was a good fit as soon as it came to me. Before, I was out there trying to just make an income because I felt I wasn't pulling my weight in the household, so I was like, I just need to get a job. And every single thing was no. Either I was overqualified, or I didn't have enough time in a position, and I was just like, God, what am I doing? <laughs> like, what is the purpose here? And then I just said, okay, well, I'm just gonna work my little zone and stay in my lane. And then when doors started to open, once I focused in on just staying in my lane and doing my purpose, that's when I realized, okay, this is my mission. Mm -hmm. Like, making this place for me so that it can open doors for other people, that's my mission. And so I think, it grew along the way and it's probably still gonna change even more, but hopefully it's evolving, not necessarily like changing in a bad way, but just growing to embrace more things. But yeah, I love to, to get it to the point where you're opening doors for other people while still staying in your purpose, like Patrice said. And Deshaun, I'm gonna give you the final word on this. <laughs> About uh, about the mission and about yeah, let's talk. Let's let's talk. <laughs> I just want to make it rain. I, that's what I want to do. I want to make it rain. Um, seriously though, like in in all honesty, like I know that. So when I was a teacher, I could see the tangible. Um, impact of what I did, because kids would come back to me and like, hey, you were my, the best teacher ever. Um, so I could see that this is a little bit different. Sometimes you don't see the tangible part. Um, part of our mission is to buy from other small Southern businesses, so everything we buy come from other small Southern businesses. But bigger than that, like at least once a week, I have someone emailing me, another female entrepreneur, saying you are the role model for me. So now it's just like, it turned into something way bigger mm -hmm. than I ever anticipated. You know, I affect my employees because, hey, I, I signed the checks, you know, so they get paid. My goal is to get everybody to a living wage. We're almost there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a role model to people. Um, it's just, you, it's, it's hard to quantify. So you say you're doing this like little one thing, and then when you go out into the world and you look back at what you're doing, your mission becomes something so much bigger. Mm -hmm. So 
I love that. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful, you know, moment to end on as well. And I just want to thank all of you for sharing, for being part of this community and to show what military spouses, um, former or otherwise, once a military spouse, always a military spouse, but showing what military spouses are really doing and the diversity of the companies and capabilities and skills that we have and how we can bring those to the world. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for, for being here and for sharing um, with us about you know the, the journey, um, the struggles uh, and the victories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.